Thank you very much. Good morning. You're watching Tuesday's Right Stuff with me, Matthew Wright. It is the 23rd of February, the day I bring you good news. News of a great British victory against the Germans. We may be rubbish when it comes to penalty shootouts against our sauerkraut-munching European cousins, but when it comes to brewing strong beer, we can sink them outright. The Germans, OK, they recently unveiled Bismarck, the world's strongest ale, containing a staggering 40% alcohol by volume. That is stronger than my favourite Scotch whisky, which may explain why the Scots have decided to take the Jerry's on and brew an even stronger beer. This is it. It's called Sink the Bismarck. <laughs> It's, uh, it's 41 per cent uh, by volume. <laughs> but what does it taste like? Let's ask our panel. First of all, we've got Sanji Pascal, ladies and gentlemen. I can smell it. Mel Gidroy, she's next to him. And our special guest, Professor Lord Winston, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Right. Now, this is the way to start the day. I'm guessing at 41 per cent proof. We're not going to need a bottle each. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing, unless, of course, you're from Newcastle, in which case... Can I just say, Matthew, I can smell it from here. I Literally, it's that's so pungent. It does actually smell like beer <laughs> rather Thank than you. whiskey. Oh, hello, I don't know about that. Oh, smell blimey. Like... <laughs> that's wow. pretty Gosh, intense. That's, yeah, that is. So, what do you reckon? Uh, sink the bismarck, let's give it a go. Let's try it. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Please. Cheers. 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 Sorry that you can't... Cheers. Oh, my. Sorry. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> You've it's lost not... the power of speech, Mel. <laughs> God. It's... Well, that finishes the program. <laughs> 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 what shall next? Do I stop now? Oh, that's <laughs> <sucking. laughs> oh. <laughs> That is... That is kind of... That's really foul. <laughs> 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 that is that's like drain cleaner. That is well, nice. That is like it drain cleaner. No, no, like... the drain it's doing a favour to drain cleaner. It's worse than drain cleaner. It tastes like beer, <laughs> I mean, though, it's... doesn't it? It tastes like beer. There is an yeah. Oh, Robert, I'm slightly plastered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm slightly... That's gone straight to the head. That's a mistake. You can't see Robert. Right. Robert's legs are just moving by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but he's still at the top. <laughs> 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 When do you, oh, you get this? <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> right, now, uh, it goes without saying that Robert is phenomenally bright, OK? He's a surgeon, fertility expert, scientist, writer, TV presenter, budding alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are now. I mean, on TV front, I mean, who could forget the human body or child of our time? His latest endeavour is this, the written word, bad ideas, an interesting history of our inventions. Now... In essence, and I'm hoping I'm going to get this right, in essence, for every scientific advancement, there are negatives. Mm. Which we never predict at the time when they're made. That's the point. And so, I mean, it's a history that goes right through from the hand axe right up to modern nanotechnology and the ability to create life um, in the laboratory, so-called synthetic biology. And the point is that um, I'm hugely in favour of technology, but technology has a downside that we never predict at the time and which threatens us now more than ever. The book is topical because, of course, the biggest worry that we have now is, is climate change, and that's probably as a result of technology. So the Did issue is how do we deal with all those, those problems that we create ourselves? Is the, is the <coughs> urge that you had to write this book, does that reflect on the fact that perhaps scientists don't want to acknowledge uh, that there are negatives to...? I think that the, the, the book is really quite a serious... Um, well, I don't think it's, a, I mean, it's an easy read. I, I hope people find that. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a serious attempt to recognise that scientists and society have to work together. Right. Um, and that actually one of the things that I keep on pointing out in the book using all sorts of themes is to demonstrate one of the things you can't do is to trust governments to use science wisely because they don't do it, no matter whether they're democratic or totalitarian. And the real need, I think, is for people to be more literate in science so they can argue and ask the right questions. It's fascinating, because, of course, I mean, the, the Professor Nutt situation... This, yes, this well, sort of Professor Nutt, of course, it, it's very, very, very... I mean, I, unfortunately, I'd, I'd written the text before David Nutt and uh, uh, Alan Johnson had their argument, but, of course, it's absolutely a pertin pertinent to this book. OK. Now, um, ultimately, you're optimistic for mankind, aren't you? 
Yes, I'd rather live now in 2010 than 1910 or 1810 or 1710. So the book argues that technology on the whole has improved our lives immeasurably, but the technology is getting more persuasive, more dangerous, more powerful, and therefore we have to be much more aware of how we use it, um, whether it's uh, nuclear technology at one level or the internet at the other level. I mean, the internet is a democratizing force, but as I point out in the book, it's also deeply anti-democratic. It's a, it's a source of sedition, of libel, mm. of violence. Pornography. Uh, pornography. Just thought I'd mention it, that's and, all I've heard. And, yeah. the, and, <laughs> and the jihadists. Yeah, you know, some true. of those were recruited as a result of looking on the internet. Good point. So, would, would, you, would you say that the, the internet was the greatest technical uh, well, advancement I, in the last I, 50 years? I, I, so. I, it sounds you, what I do is I, I, I look at the history of writing and I go right through and show that writing was quite seditious from the very start, mm -hmm. uh, 4,000 years ago when it first started. And, People have been burning books ever since um, the Kingdom of Uruk, which is now Iraq, of course, um, back in... So that they weren't burning books, they were burning tablets, because repeatedly humans have tried to stamp out knowledge when it didn't suit the government, particularly, mm. or the <laughs> governing power. <laughs> and that's really interesting, because, of course, it happened in Stalin's time, certainly happened with Hitler. Um, and the interesting thing is now the Internet, of course, is much more difficult to police or regulate. So... Um, it's much harder to censor things. Isn't that the truth? Mm. What do you think is the greatest technological... I can't say technological after that bit. <laughs> <laughs> Techn Techn I can't say very much at Techn all. Technologi <laughs> Techn technological <laughs> advance well, in the last 50 years. I've never seen you drunk. Oh, dear. <laughs> I've got a very light head. <laughs> <laughs> Give her <laughs> another one. <laughs> <Robert. laughs> <That's the story. laughs> <laughs> um, He's a doctor, he well, knows. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it's this beer? I don't, <clears throat> I don't know, but actually one of the things... I, I think there are a number, but one of the things in the last 50 years that I think is... Um, I, I mean, I think writing is, in the, is perhaps one of the most important. Yeah. But I think that um, in the last 50 years, perhaps the microchip has pervaded mm. our lives in a way that we never thought possible. The interesting thing about that, and it, it's in the book very much, that the advantages of these technologies are never seen at the time. Nobody foresee, foresaw, for example, that the microchip would be used for, you know, the television camera yeah. uh, or the radio set, or indeed to drive a bionic limb for an yeah. Afghanistani victim who's had his leg shot off, mm. which drives his artificial limb. Um, and it drives your car, it drives your fridge, you know, it controls our aircraft. But it's also, of course, um, dangerous. I guess on the way to the studio, all of us would have gone through major roads if we came by traffic. On, uh, the chances are we would have been photographed perhaps a thousand times. Oh, yeah. And of course, that information. I, I thought I thought on. you were talking about the Prius. You see. <laughs> I didn't put makeup on then. But you weren't drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Not then. <laughs> now I've got to ask you this as well. I, I, time is short. <clears throat> I, I, I read this on Wikipedia, which is a gospel of all things half true. But is it true at one point you turned your back on medicine for the theatre? Is that is that right? That you, yeah, you I, did, drama I did actually. Drama? About yeah. about um, in, in I won't tell you when because it makes me sound very very old. <laughs> but a long time ago, I direct I did direct my own theatre company and directed at the end of the festival. So at that at that point, were you were you thinking to hell with with medicine? Yes, I was. God, I was very. Can you imagine I was, how... Well, it was very. You know, in the in the sixties when I was a medical student, it was very authoritarian. And I didn't like that. I mean, it's, medicine's changed. In fact, actually, not always for the better, as I explain in Bad Ideas, but it has changed. But I, I always wanted to do theatre, and there was a big crisis about whether I should do arts or science. And eventually I chose science, but it took a long time to come well, to my senses. Well, he's missed out, though! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> showbiz! Actually, you're as showbiz as the rest of well, us. Well, <laughs> television's a bit nice. Good to have you here. It really is.